board, I of course a slight hold up. My learned junior, Mr. Mant, um, recollected a case called Maurice in France, which is about disciplining lawyers. Um, my learned friend was suggesting that the majority of remarks might be made by lawyers against judges, um, but that necessarily would answer the submission of these subjects to regulation. Um, this is just a case which, in a couple of paragraphs, would suggest that the Grand Chamber have seen that as something which, which justifies interference with Article 10 rights. I don't know if it would be of any... Probably all depends, doesn't it? Would, it, would, would you like, like to give practice. us the reference, anyway? I, I, I've got copies of you here. Right. Um, the, um, it's 2016-62-EHRR1. But I do have a copy for each of you. Um, right. <coughs> There's no objection to our seeing it. I, I've given my <coughs> friend um, a copy. Of course, he must reply in the law. We're really looking for the benefit of your note, although I accept it's fact-specific, from paragraph 134, which begins, consequently, freedom of expression is applicable also to lawyers, to uh, 139, and in that paragraph, <coughs> the judgment says, lawyers cannot, moreover, make remarks of associates they overstep the permissible expression of comments without a sound factual basis, nor can they proper insights. Yeah. Right. Um, before you um, uh, get into your stride, yes. could, can you just help us with the point on the chronology? Um, yes. The, there was a series of interim order suspensions, but then... Um, In January 20, the suspensions were revoked, but the um, interim order of the tribunal imposed conditions which were then extended. Do we have that order? What, and what were the conditions? Uh, we, we can get it for you. My recollection, um, I'm sure I'll stand corrected, is that the health issues led to health conditions rather than conduct issues. But we will we will check that. Those behind me, I hope, have got access to the GMC database and we can we can check that for you. Right. So um, until from first June twenty twenty to eleventh January twenty twenty two um, Straddle was suspended from 11th January until the tribunal sanctioned decision. He wasn't suspended, but he was subject to conditions yes. on health grounds. And then since then, he's been suspended. Or what, what, what happens when well, <coughs> I can like just perhaps explain um, in a little detail. The interim orders tribunal is a creature of section 41A of the uh, Medical Act. The order for immediate suspension is made pursuant to section 38 of the Medical Act. At the moment that the sanction is delivered in this, this case, the interim order of conditions, with both being changed with <coughs> is automatically revoked. Yeah. The immediate suspension comes into effect because the doctor has 28 days to appeal. And if he isn't suspended in the initial 28 days before the, the actual six month sanction is imposed, I, I think your should know it's often at the doctor's level, so it's singularly unfair that the immediate suspension adds another month. But that's what seems to happen. If the doctor appeals, the Section 38 immediate suspension remains in force until the resolution of the appeal. So that was until the judgment was handed down to Justice Swift. Then once that's handed down, his six-month suspension starts. Yes. Um. I don't know whether it affects the, the um, case, but I mean, just, his, just historically, it seems rather unfair. Well, it, so it, if you if you are 
if you are subject to a sanction of, say, six months suspension, yes. and um, suppose there's no appeal against the finding of impairment, only against the sanction, <laughs> you're wasting your time appealing against the sanction because uh, even if you win, you you will have spent about that long. Well, quite often longer, my lord. Quite often longer. Um, I've appeared before your lordship in section 40 appeals when my, my doctor's been suspended for in excess of two years, a combination of IOT and um, <coughs> interim suspensions and then immediate suspension following uh, sanctions decision. And there is some case law which I'll, I'll take your lord, lordship to. The reason that that came into being, if I could just possibly digress, when I first started doing this work in the late 80s, early 90s, every doctor appealed. And we knew, um, because we appealed to the Privy Council, it would take between six and nine months for the appeal to come on. Cynical doctors would then sell their practices, get their affairs in order, um, possibly see if they could practice abroad. A lot of my erstwhile clients ended up in the Middle East, where they didn't seem too concerned about decisions of the General Medical Council, and then abandon the appeal a week or two before the Privy Council hearing, which was a huge waste of judicial uh, man or woman power. Uh, and when the new regime came in in 2004, which was the fitness to practice regime, the Lordship may recall, I think from 88, it was CS Professional Misconduct. That was a game of two halves, <coughs> whereas this is a game of three thirds. So it's facts, impairment, sanction. The old regime was facts. And then the advocates put in the un unenviable position of saying, we don't think those facts amount to CS Professional Misconduct, but if which is denied they do, here is my mitigation. Um, and so that's now all been teased out into three separate sections. But my Lord, so far as unfairness is concerned in totality, the distinction that the courts have traditionally made between the interim suspension or interim conditions, which in some cases, doctors argue, the conditions are so onerous they're effectively a suspension, and there's some case law on that, is that the interim orders tribunal does not make factual findings. It is seen at the time that they are engaged with the process as a risk assessment. Simpliciter. And because the fitness to practice panel makes the factual findings, which you'd have seen in the determinations, it's at that moment that the sanction for the conduct is imposed. But there's no reason in principle why that tribunal imposing the sanction shouldn't have regard to the fact they've been off the road for 18 months. It, that if, is, if they are otherwise fit, that, I mean, and part of the penalty is to mark the seriousness with which these things are considered. That is correct. And in fact, well, <coughs> we may as well start back with the deal with this first. Yes, why not? Um, the sanction determination, which you'll See beginning at page 170. My Lord, I'm going to take uh, you and, uh, and your brother judges to page 171. They are told in paragraph 11 by Mr. Kitchen, who was acting for the General Medical Council, presenting the case, that he'd been suspended for a period of time under the terms of an interim order, and this had led to the fact that he had to work abroad. The weight to be attached to this fact was for the tribunal to decide. So that was the return to Pakistan, as I understand. But that's SG sanctions guidance was clear that it should not place undue weight on this early period of suspension for the reasons set out in the sanctions guidance. Now, this morning, I saw, I think, a reference to a, a paragraph which I don't think we've had copied for you, so I think you ought to have the advice given to the tribunal on how, if at all, 
to take account of an interim suspension. The sanctions guidance. Sanctions guidance. It's not in the bundle. It is, but I don't think that particular paragraph is, and, and I will undertake to make sure you have it. <coughs> if it's like the nursing and midwifery one, it was perfectly fairly written to try and avoid people being unfair to the registrant. Oh, sorry, I'm told it's 526. Let me just have a it's look. paragraph 22, is it? Let me just have a look. Yeah. 526. <coughs> yeah, 22, paragraph 22. I'm, I'm grateful to my learned friends. 526, paragraph 26. It's the right hand side of the page. The doctor may have had an interim order to restrict and remove the registration while the GMC investigates the concerns however the tribunal should not be unduly wasted as to whether a doctor has had an interim order and how long the order is in place. This is because an interim order's tribunal makes no finding of the fact and its test for considering whether to repose an interim order is entirely different from the criteria that the medical practitioner that medical practitioners tribunals use when considering an appropriate sanction on the doctor's practice. Now, your lordship is of course correct my, my Lord, Lord Justice Dingamans when he uh, invites me I'm sure to take you to how he looked at matters and that's page 226 of the main authorities bundle the Amberova case and sanction starts uh, page 230 of our bundle Paragraph 32. So 230, my lord, power 32. So there's a complaint about her being suspended when she worked in the intervening period. So I thought that's she was suspended. And then at the bottom of that page, there's a power of sentence beginning. In that skeleton argument, Ms. Flex submitted that the purpose of interim order for public protection pending the resolution of the cases. And that by reference to the judgment of the administrative court in the Koku versus Nursing Midwifery Council. Uh, ISOs and sanctions were different orders, and then it goes on to deal with the facts of that case. Then um, you have, uh, as my Lord, Lord Justice Dingham has said, the, the careful wording in paragraph 35. Pa panels needed to be cautious. They did not give disproportionate weight to whether the has previously been subject to an interim order. Um, at the end of paragraph 30, the guidance was specifically stated that an interim order and the length of any such order will be of limited or no significance to panels determining sanction in light of the finding of impairment, in finding of impaired fitness to practice. <coughs> and then it seems that guidance was to ensure the panels did not take an unduly harsh view of restaurants simply because they had been subject to an interim order. I say that because paragraph 31 noted that an ISO might be relevant because a restaurant might say they had had insufficient time to remedy defects in practice. But there's nothing in the guide that suggests that registrants who might have spent up to 18 months, on some occasions over 18 months, suspended before the disciplinary hearing should not have that period of time taken into account as a relevant factor by the committee when determining the proportion of sanction. Now, the, the statute provides that interim, uh, so interim orders uh, can only be made for a maximum of 18 months and, and should be reviewed every six months. Now, in this case, as you'd have seen from the papers, um, there was an extension beyond the 18 months, I'm trying to be as fair as I can to the doctor, which requires judicial oversight. And normally what happens is, go along to the High Court with a statement from a member of the General Medical Council's staff, which says this is the reason why we haven't been able to deal with this in 18 months. We will need X amount of time before we can get to the hearing. The court quite often will impose a fairly rigid timetable and say, look, you've got to get on with it. Um, so they might ask for 12 months, they quite often get six, and it has to be listed. Um, and, and then the, the fitness to practice panel hearing ensues. Yes, well, we, we know that's what happens. But 
do the GMC say that what my lord um, said in the Camberova case was wrong? Well, Lord, I think what the General Medical Council's position would be is that every case uh, revolves uh, around its merits. Uh, there seems to have been, and uh, it, it, my understanding of the last hearing, I don't think it was actually necessarily appreciated by the doctor that the appeal would have the effect of his suspension not taking place alongside the the, the adjourn, adjourn period. Um, I think there was an element of surprise when after six months had elapsed, he couldn't return to work. But it was explained that he was actually suspended on Section 38, not Section 41A. Well, that's a different point. Um, no, they, haven't, they haven't said specifically it shouldn't apply. They haven't changed their um, guidance. And as far as I'm aware, because that, that decision of uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Dinklands, I think was October 2016, yeah. the preceding case of Abdul Razak, which is Stephen, so Stephen Sil Silver, I think was decided the preceding May, looking at page 205. And on this issue, um, I think the relevant part is towards the end of the judgment, from about paragraph 83. You see it's sense of getting second, Mr. Bartfeld. Sorry. Page yeah. 222, my lord, you thought it's Bartfeld. So it's, it's the case immediately before my lord, Lord Justice Dingman's case. And this is called Abdul Razak. It was decided about five months before, in 2016. And I was taking your lordship to paragraph 83. That says said to rely on a decision of EDJ. Well, it's said to be past the background circumstances, but it would be inappropriate to regard it as analogous to the period of imprisonment served while on remand, which would normally be deducted from any custodial term imposed by the <coughs> sentencing court. Well, I sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Ford, this, this, this is the history of the case law. I would like to know whether the, <coughs> the GMC seek to argue that what my Lord said in the Canberra case was wrong. And coming fresh to this issue, so it seems to me that it's one thing for a tribunal on the question of sanction to say, we think a fair, a further period of suspension is necessary to pr protect the public because we are not satisfied even now that the doctor is fit to practice. But if they are imposing a sanction, as it were, as a penalty, then while, of course, it's not like remanding custody, which is taken into account automatically and 100%, not to take it into account at all seemed to me to be very unfair. Well, my Lord, they would say it's not a penalty. It, it's there to mark the disapproval of the regulator. Well, that's a penalty. But, but the fortunes, uh, if, if you'd allow me to continue with, with this authority, because the, the rationale is given in paragraphs 84 and 85. Um, so, Mr. Hamer submits there should be, this is paragraph 84, no deduction. We're relying on the decision of EDJ. Um, that, of course, is very much placed as a, a remand scenario. Then he approves the paragraph or EDJ had that I've just read to you. So we would say sanction in particular, and even Maloney Friend can see this, is something where uh, an appellate court should be extremely circumspect because they are the professional body that are deciding how to mark the proven conduct. That's what they're that's what they're doing at this stage. And so as it goes on to say in paragraph 85, 
the task of, for the committee when deciding the appropriate sanction of a disciplinary case is radically different from that of a sentencing judge in criminal proceedings. First, as Sir Thomas Bingham MR has explained, a, fre in the, a frequently quoted passage in Bolton against the Stone, so Bolton against the Law Society, the committee, unlike a sentencing judge, has to follow the golden rule that the reputation of the profession is more important than the fortunes of an individual member. This approach has been widely adopted as it is shown by the judgment cited in paragraphs 88 and 89 below. Second, and perhaps more importantly, the committee, as the professional disciplinary body, is concerned with deciding whether it's safe for a person to practice, and that is not a concern of a sentencing judge. It is these crucial differences which mean that time spent subject to an interim order need not be deducted from the period of suspension, as otherwise the committee would not be fulfilling the important functions of the disciplinary body of protecting the reputation of the profession and ensuring that it would be, uh, it would be safe for the registrar to resume practice. Indeed, if the contrary view had been adopted, the committee might well have been allowing the registrar to practice much earlier than when it would have been safe to do so. And when one comes to the sanction decision in this case, uh, you will have no doubt observed that the committee were concerned that there was initially little insight and still insight to be... <coughs> so we can pick up their views perhaps being hinted at um, in the impairment determination at page 157, where again I hope I'm fairly putting what Mr. Adil appears to have been submitting and indicated he didn't um, give evidence on it. will be returning to, to this, but Mr. Adil's submission starts at paragraph 28, and this is impairment, it's not sanction, so this wasn't just a response to sanction, I'm going to say mea culpa in the hope that I, I don't get too severe a punishment, this is at the impairment stage where he's presumably seeking to argue he's not impaired. Mr. Adil submitted that he now understood the impact of his conduct in the video and had reflected and taken steps to remediate. This type of conduct was unlikely to be repeated and therefore his fitness to practice was not currently impaired. He now followed GMC and NHS guidelines for social media and was aware of how to handle social media. As well as this, he'd also read BMA and Medical Defence Union guidance. Mr Adam told the tribunal that in relation to paragraph 4 of the allegation, and I can remind you what that was, that was the one relating to the undermining of public health, acting contrary to accepted medical opinion and undermining public confidence in the medical profession. He had accepted under oath that his previous comments might have undermined public health, that they were contrary to widely accepted opinion in the UK and across the world and might have undermined public confidence. This was a story of the past in which he had a poor understanding of the situation and didn't understand the virus. He had displayed poor judgment under very difficult circumstances and had gone on to be a frontline NHS worker following all COVID guidelines and protocols and advocating social distancing and the use of masks, etc., and had saved lives. Paragraph 38. Mr. Adams admitted he was part of the medical profession and always maintained trust. He had integrity and there were no issues with probity. His comments about the vaccination in paragraph 2G, and that's the paragraph where he uh, said that the COVID-19 vaccines would be given to everyone by force if necessary, that they could potentially contain microchips that affect the human body and further the 5G mobile phone technology agenda, that they would transform human psychology and beliefs, and that they could be used to control and or reduce the world population. He says of that paragraph that the comments were a silly error of judgment when there was nothing happening about a vaccine at the time. What he said in paragraph 2G was open quotes, rubbish close quotes, and he had reflected and gained insight. He, <coughs> said that he did not stand by his words, and if he believed in what he had said, he would not have been vaccinated himself. Mr. Adel told the tribunal that he created awareness in Pakistan with regards to social distancing and the wearing of masks and advised patients according to UK guidelines. 
relation to paragraphs three and four, and those are the, the videos, <coughs> um, Mr. Adol submitted that he gained insight into his action. He deeply regretted his actions and extensive <coughs> apologies. He had reflected and realised he should not have introduced himself as a doctor. And the Lord, whilst concede this case, is important <coughs> to the doctor, it's important to the public, in terms of when Article 10 rights can be interfered with against this background. And it's very important to the regulators, not just the regulator for whom I act, but the other health regulators, because as I shall be coming to submit, there is a difference between the rather rigid approach when Edwin takes around clarity and <coughs> statute and the role of the regulator. Professionals are regulated. That is the contract. And they really ought to have, in my submission, sufficient ability to recognise when their misconduct, because I, I still argue, my lord, that Section 35 is enough, but certainly in conjunction with case law, and in conjunction with good medical practice, which I'll take you to in a moment, um, properly informed, a doctor in, in Mr. Adel's position should have known, without the need for um, advice uh, from anybody, that what he was saying had the potential to undermine public confidence in the profession, which includes uh, Christopher Whitty, who is uh, on the medical register. Um, he also has access to a medical defence organisation because you have to be a member of one to be on the register. So there is medical legal advice readily available. And in my experience, it's, it's, it's high quality. And it's really, well, we would submit a question of common sense in terms of looking at your conduct objectively as a professional. Well, I think that's going on to ground one. I thought yes. we were still on ground three at the moment. No, I am. I, I apologise. Can, can I just deal with yes, of course. the question on ground three? Yes. And go to can the I just, passage. Just, can I just very quickly course, give an yeah. insight, and then, then I'll have finished it. Yeah, I, do sorry, I thought you'd go on to ground I, one. I, I digress. I apologise. So what I was going to just say was to take you um, to what they continued to... What they then went on to say about um, the, the, the misconduct, which is from page 164 on this. So they cite 65, you must make sure your conduct justifies your patient's trust in you and the public's trust in the profession, <coughs> etc. But the important part is that when they then come to deal with uh, sanction, which is page 170, that's in, I've taken you to 171, paragraph 11, so that's the debate about the interim order uh, position, which I know you're, you're in for me to address here. And then... Um, you've got what Mr. Adil said on page 173 um, about developing of insight, etc. Um, that he said something silly, not in the best interest of the public, which he reflected on paragraph 25. Well, he too, at par paragraph 28 on 173, he too made the point that he's had his punishment over the last few years. Because uh, of the interim suspension order, so that the submissions on both sides okay. to the tribunal were you you can take it into account, uh, but Mr. Kitching had said give it uh, limited weight, give, give it such weight as you think fit, but not undue weight. And the reason that they imposed a um, they they found him to be currently impaired which is why they got to the sanction stage. You can see 177, paragraph 51. I'm sorry to keep holding up, but then the, the, the tribunal had recorded those submissions, and then at 175, the tribunal gave its own little list of the... Ag uh, well, considered and balanced the aggravating and mitigating factors, and mitigating doesn't include any time spent on an interim suspension. No, suspension order. That's, that was correct. And where, where it does come in, I, I believe, my lord, is um, para 51 on page 177. And then they acknowledge apologies and insight in relation to paragraph 2. In relation to paragraph 3, the tribunal noted Mr. Adler's evidence of being contradictory. <coughs> At times, he acknowledged he'd used positions adopted in the UK to add credence to his opinions, and that, that's the important. N nobody here is saying he can't express these opinions. It's when he seeks to possibly enhance uh, the validity of his opinions by saying, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor of 30 years' experience. He's a colorectal surgeon. 
He's not a virologist. He's not an epidemiologist. He's not a, a vaccine researcher. He, he has a scientific qualification. Uh, it's whether it is in my submission sufficiently expert for him even to express the views that he did. But many of the views he expressed were not based in science at all, such as the Bill Gates conspiracy theory, the fact that people will be microchipped and that will be vaccinated. So he says, uh, the government said, whilst at other times he told the tribunal that he'd merely described, I think that should be his role, not his role, and qualifications as a way to introduce himself. And your lordships have highlighted passages of the transcripts of the interview, which I, I don't think I need to take the lordships to, but that they, they reflect the charges. Um, and, and you'll find uh, certainly them exhibited to the Yusuf. Um, witness statement, which you'll find starting at page 220, and then the exhibits, which are the transcripts, uh, start at 226 and onwards. And you'll see, I think, on every occasion, very early on in these YouTube <coughs> interviews, the doctor explains that he's a surgeon of 30 uh, years' experience. But this is why they imposed the separate sanction. 53. The tribunal was particularly concerned in relation to Mr. Adil's continued lack of insight into the impact of his conduct, as set out in paragraph 4 of the allegation. The effect on public health, espousing views that were contrary to widely accepted medical opinion at the time, and undermining public confidence in the medical profession. As it has said in its earlier determinations, these statements made by an experienced UK doctor could have led to some of those members of the public believing Mr. Adil not taking up the vaccine or complying with restrictions. This clearly had the potential to cause harm, and the tribunal determined that the first strand of the overarching objective was invoked in this case. The tribunal did acknowledge however, that the potential for such harm was broad, it was indirect, and relied upon Mr. Adil's comments being believed and acted upon. In the tribunal's view, it was not analogous to harm caused by a di di doctor's direct acts or omissions in relation to <coughs> a particular patient. And you'll see, reading through the determinations, that other things arose on the transcripts, such as social distancing and the wearing of masks. And the regulator chose not to charge those matters because they, they, there's still scientific, I think, uncertainty about the efficacy of masks. Um, the tribunal took into consideration it's finding that statements were made by an otherwise outstanding medical practitioner undermined confidence of the public in the profession, and therefore the second limit of the overarching objective was invoked. In the tribunals, view, such conduct also undermined the maintenance promotion of proper professional standards for doctors, and as such, the third limb of the overarching objective was also uh, relevant. The tribunal noted that even at this stage, before the GMC submissions, Mr. Adder was still questioning the validity of paragraph four, proposing there was no proof. In addition, Mr. Adil continued to challenge the GMC investigative process and the evidence it had put behind before the tribunal, particularly relating to the anonymity of individual complainants. This highlighted Mr. Adil's lack of appreciation of the gravity and impact of his action, and also his ongoing lack of insight into some parts of his behaviour, which continued as late as autumn 2020. For this reason, the tribunal could not be satisfied there was no risk of repetition, as it had said in its earlier determination. Overall, it was of the view that the risk of repetition was low, but consider that this arose more from Mr. Adil's concern about the personal hardships he and his family had faced in consequence of his actions than from an appreciation of the impact of his actions as set out in paragraph four of the allegation. And then they go on to consider um, that uh, suspension. Can I just, if you're flicking over it, paragraph 58? Yes, of course. The tribunal specifically says that a sanction of suspension would have a deterrent effect. And send the appropriate message to the profession and the wider public interest that such misconduct is unacceptable. Of, of course. Yeah. And um, the authority that you referred us to talked about, obviously, safety. And if there is a continuing lack of insight, well, then you need to work out how long he needs before that. But why does a deterrence not take account of what you've served leading up to that period. Well, it depends whether it, sorry, depends whether it means deterrence to him or to what us. is often referred to in the authorities as a legitimate purpose of a sanction, mm -hmm. deterrent to others. I think it's really a warning it's, shot it's, to others, my lord. Well, but, it's, but, but, speaking but, myself, but, it seems to be entirely ambiguous yes. in paragraph 50. But, but, but even if, even if that, that's the case, what you have to think about from the regulator's point of view and the protection of the public is paramount. Here they have a doctor with a developing insight where they think the risk of repetition is low, but it's not entirely 
um, negligible. And what they say in paragraph 72, which is page 181, as part of their of a process of oversight of a registrar, is we're going to direct a review shortly before the end of the period of suspension. And we'll want him to demonstrate how he's further developed insight and reached the appropriate level of understanding about the impact of his actions. And then they say it would, may assist the, the reviewing tribunal it won't necessarily be this one. If he provides a detailed re written recollection about his appreciation and understanding of the gravity of his misconduct, its impact on public health and public confidence, and evidence that he's maintained relevant skills, uh, including training undertaken and his CPD, and any other information that he considers will assist the reviewing tribunal. And so they, they, they seem, uh, and your ships may disagree with them, but certainly this uh, specialist tribunal seem to view who heard the evidence, uh, assessed his evidence and demeanour and read his witness statements, listened to his submissions, which they've recorded faithfully, that a, a period of reflection to develop insight was needed before they could say he was unimpaired and was therefore fit to resume practice. Because that's the other element of it. He's currently impaired, so you need to impose a sanction. If you find him unimpaired, you can impose a warning, which I've always thought was, was rather... A shame that you couldn't impose a warning, but that's not what the, the rules provide for once you've been found impaired. You can only have a warning as to future conduct if you're found unimpaired. So if this appeal were to be dismissed, then a period of six months suspension would begin, and towards the end of the six months <coughs> suspension then there would be a review hearing at which he might be suspended for another year and another year and another year, depending on what the review. Uh, the, lots of heads being shaken behind you, so you'd better find out if that's wrong. <laughs> I've got a potential ethical issue, but I, 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 I'll, I'll say what I'm going to say because I think it's uncontroversial. The six-month suspension, which is under section, which is under section 35, I think, um, takes if, took effect or began after the appeal was dismissed, the section 40 appeal. So the day after Mr. Justice Swift handed down his judgment, that then set the six-month review period remind myself of when the hearing was, I think it was more than six months ago. Um, Fifth of April. Yeah, so coming up to six, ten, yeah, so it would have, would have recently expired. Um, yeah. Of course, it's last week, I think. Um, or would it know this week? <laughs> and there should have been a review hearing in the intervening period. And um, what has so happened? Well, I need to just discuss this with my learned friend. <laughs> I've been asked about it. friend and I reached an accommodation this morning uh, about the review hearing. Um, I think as I've been asked a direct question, my duty to the court is to inform you that at that review hearing, because he had not undertaken, as I understand it, I haven't seen the transcript, so it's very caveated this, the matters set out in the bullet points um, at uh, paragraph 72, of page 181, and, and I am instructed, may have doubled down on his views. I think in a document that's provided to the subsequent panel, he was erased. Okay, well, uh, we just want to know what's happened. Yes, well, not, not, not I, why. Think, I think we're meant to find fairness to him. Um, it's not actually the subject matter of the appeal, and I think, I think there was a concern. Um, 
that, that that might be seen to count against him, but I, I, I'm, I'm sure that the Lordships will <laughs> regard that as a neutral fact. If, if you believe that the Article 10 rights have been in some way infringed, then you give a judgment call. Well, well, and we're also dealing with the issue of the problems of registrants and professional bodies which are not pro progressing in these matters as quickly as they were. I mean, some of the earlier decisions were taken at a time when there weren't these delays, and then when you sat in the administrative court, literally 10 cases each day were the nursing midwifery, the doctors, etc., all asking for further extensions. So no surprise that people put then restrictions on, which it was obvious were resented. And yet, in the interim, these people are serving periods of time. To the extent there's impairment, to the extent that they are guilty of professional misconduct and need to be set off, struck off, I entirely understand. But if you're talking about marking the seriousness, which part of these sanctions are, then at the moment I need to be persuaded of why one can't take into account what's gone before. That is different from someone continuing to demonstrate a lack of insight. Well, and, and indeed, if you look at paragraph three of Canberra, I, I set out there a principle, yes. which, as I understood it, hadn't been contested. No, it's it's not been appealed, it's not been contested. Um, and my Lord, I... I, I hear and feel your frustration, as I said, I tend to be on the other side. Well, I, I, I know years. you've seen both sides, uh, um, but, but you're, you're representing the Yes, GMC. of course, of course. And um, the other um, issue, not so much in this case, but just so your Lordship may wish to think about this as well, is of course the clinical issues. And you find yourself in the slightly cleft stick if people think you've been de-skilled in the intervening period. And that's another, that's another, another issue. Well, this, this case, I think, was particularly blighted by the pandemic. If you look yes, at the timing. Yeah, well, so there were that. remote hearings and then there were in-person hearings. And, and I, I think all the IOTs were. Um, but the hearing that your Lordships are dealing with appears to have been in, in person. I think that's right. All right. Well, um, the last year, so it was not a question. Sorry, some noises off there. Right, sorry, I, I made an error. Because of this appeal, Understanding is um, that because of this appeal, the review hearing could only further suspend. Is that right? All right. Could somebody write it down for me? Sorry, it's okay. No, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I've got the, the correct instructions from behind me because, as I've said, the. Um, I think we'll just rise for a moment. Um, see if we can be told, preferably by agreement, what has happened, rightly or wrongly, and when, when the period of suspension, came. Whether, whether the appeal to this court resulted in time standing still in the game. Okay. I would hope that this would be a matter of record and of agreement. And then, when we've sorted that out, subject to my lords having any further questions about um, uh, ground three, we can go back to ground one and two. Yeah.
I mean, frankly, even if he was doing, I mean, we don't know whether or not. No, I mean, I don't think we need to worry about that with him these days, but yeah, no. I mean, as I worked it out, 35 or 35 months, which would be but that's the same yeah. yeah, so I think in the basic thing is interim order. Yeah, so the six months, I think, is when he's got conditions. It's not that it makes much difference. Yeah, we couldn't rely on that. Yeah. I probably will make sure you can stop the working with us. Right. Yeah, okay. I think that's not what they're current. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's certainly not. So, 
On the 19th of September, mm. they made a uh, Section 35 direction for erasure, yeah. but also for eight days within which he could appeal. Yeah. He has issued a notice of appeal within the yeah. 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 That means yeah. that he, that he, that he, that he, that he, that he, under paragraph 10, 11, century four, remains suspended. I mean, it's also... Of not putting in his name, that's no, constantly putting in his name of appeal. On, on, on the review. On the review, yeah. on the review direction. Yeah. So actually, there's nothing they can do. Nothing that the CMC can do. That's what could do. No. But obviously, no, I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, I can say, obviously, the subsidy should have been start. one month. It's not good enough. But right now, they can't do it. Right now, they can't do it. If they find it, it's not the last distance. It's not the last distance. Depends how they deal with it. Certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I would have been. That thing in the game can be done over. I would have been able to substitute for this. But that would have been a music factor. But if you substitute the same thing, you would have been able to do it for the job. He's still suspended on that, and then they'll decide what what's the best thing to do. And, and then that rather depends. Okay, so I mean, what, if it's so, what you then need is an expedited hearing. Yeah. 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 But either way, I would like. I would like. I still would see say if they want to revoke the suspension, revoke the suspension, revoke the suspension, revoke the suspension, and recall the suspension. Yeah. Okay. That's that's right. We're not going to revoke. We're not going to revoke. No, uh, it shouldn't be on the Okay. Um, well, you can, as I said, I think they're going to have to do anything at all. Yeah. But they could give an indication. I mean, Dingham is obviously not yeah. just that he thinks it's not going to be the Right, I think we have an agreed position. So, for, and I apologise, but um, we were trying to be circumspect about this, but um, the review hearing took place on the 19th of September 2023. 18th and 19th, to be clear. Yeah. On the 19th, the panel directed that the doctor's name be erased from the register. Yes. But also advised him that he had 28 days within which to appeal. He has served a notice of appeal. I don't think we've had um, grounds yet. And the effect of that, under Schedule 4, paragraphs 10 and 11 of the Medical Act, 1983 as amended <coughs> is that he remains suspended until the determination of this second appeal. Now, and that's, just, a, that's to the administrative court. Yes, yes. It's a section 40 appeal. Yes. Um, well, I'm, I think it only right that we should get you. Those bits of the statute. Yes, please. If you're going to comment. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still slightly unclear. Yes. The review that took place. Was the 18th and 19th of September. Was that a review of the 
six month suspension, which came into effect you know, following the judgment of Mr. Justice Swift, or right. was it a review of the um, immediate order, which the government imposed? So, so the effect the of the statute is that uh, it, it only suspends operation of the, the sanction, the initial sanction. For, the first, for the first appeal. Yeah. And, and the immediate suspension <coughs> order falls in at the, as soon as the appeal judgment is handed down. So, and it's all first appeal. Second appeal is, is irrelevant for these purposes. First appeal at the moment. Sorry, what, what I mean, first, first level of the appeal. First level of the appeal. appeal to this court the appeal to this does court. not stop time running. No. Thank you. And which section under the Medical Act is that? I'm told, um, and I've only seen it very briefly on screen, that... The, so all the directions are made under Section 35, Erase Your Suspension Conditions. The direction to erase that was made by the previous, by the panel that sat on the 18th and 19th of September, also contained within it the advice that you have 28 days to appeal. The doctor has appealed the decision to, the direction to erase him. That then means he's suspended, in effect, administratively until that appeal is determined under paragraphs 10 and 11 of Schedule 4 of the Medical Act as amended. And, and I will undertake to get you the, the relevant provisions. Yes, that's fine. It's buried in, in the schedule, I, I, I apologise. All right, thank you very much. And uh, you, you, you answered the question about the subsequent history because we were concerned to know about the suspensions. I'm sure I speak for all of us in saying that whether the decision to erase was right right or wrong is nothing to do with this case. It ni neither strengthens nor weakens either side's case. And I, and I can't assist you as to how that no, no. case was presented. No. I've not seen a transcript. No, no. Um, I'm asked um, to, to take your Lordships, on page 178 to paragraph 58, so I've explained it better now to the decision to suspend, because um, obviously you're concerned about the parents' effect. What the tribunals say, uh, as well as the parent effect, send the appropriate message to the profession and the wider public interest that such misconduct is unacceptable. It would meet all three limbs of the overarching objective and mark the seriousness of the allegation. And then the other relevant paragraphs would take you to our uh, paragraph 70 on page 180. And this is how they enunciate the purpose of the period of the suspension. So, Bullet point, first bullet point, to mark the seriousness and send the appropriate signals to add all to the public and the profession about such conduct being unbefitting of a registered doctor. Uh, bullet point two, allow sufficient time for Mr. Adol to continue his remediation and to reflect carefully and deeply on the tribunal's findings and his conduct such that he was able to demonstrate his understanding and appreciation of the impact of his conduct on public health and confidence in the profession. The tribunal notes the review tribunal would expect to see evidence of meaningful reflection and genuine insight, in which this will allow Mr. Adol to return to unrestricted practice. And the third bullet point, if Mr. Adol was able so to reflect and demonstrate the genuine insight, not to find the NHS of a the service of a very capable service for any longer than was necessary. So those are their full reasons. Now, um, my Lord Lord Justice opinions is of course correct to say on the basis of his uh, authority um, and the principles he enunciated, I think he told me in the third paragraph, there's been no challenge to that um, approach. Uh, and if it, I have to concede that it is, um, this is not a case which is looking at um, an analogy with a period of time on the mark. Uh, it, it, it's taken to, to a, a slightly more esoteric uh, level. So it's not making the criminal contrast, which I, which Abdul Razak does. So I, I, hope, I hope I put that, that there. C can I just ask, I hope finally, um, <laughs> just, just uh, as a factual matter, we, we've looked at the sanction determination and the argument and the bullet point summarising the mitigating and aggravating factors. Yeah. Do, do you say 
that the tribunal did in this case take into account the interim sanctions orders. Well, well the submission was made that they, they, they could, but they shouldn't take, <coughs> didn't have to attach much weight. I can't. That's not my question. I cannot, no, I know, I cannot recollect a specific reference to taking into account of the fact of an interim suspension in the determination, but I, I, I probably need to check. But I don't, I don't recollect. No, well, I, I think, I'm not trying to catch you out. I think that the, what we looked at at 175, which are the bullet points, yes. are the aggravating and mitigating factors which doesn't they themselves include. identified. So what, what, what your lordship observed, and I have to concede, I don't think mitigating says interim suspension. All right, I'm told the interim order is not mitigation. That's why it's not listed at paragraph 43. Um, but do they tell us they, do, 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 <laughs> is, is it your submission that they did take it into account? Well, all, or is it your submission uh, that uh, they didn't, but for the reasons you've been explaining, it wasn't something that uh, uh, carried it, any or any significant Well, there are two ones. things, I think, my lord. They got the submission, so they were aware of the fact that there'd been an interim suspension, and for some period of time. Yeah. And it, my, my submission would be, it is a matter for the panel as the guidance suggests, as to how much weight they take to the fact of and length of an interim suspension. And the authorities would tend to suggest that a court in, in, in this court's position should be fairly circumspect when dealing with sanction decisions. Well, I'm not sure it's an answer to my question, but if, if that's all you want to say, that's, that's fine. I, I can't point to a specific reference in the mitigating factors, if that's where your lordship thinks it should be. We have also taken into account the fact of the interim suspension. All I can point to is that they were made aware of the fact there had been one. Okay. Thank you. But in fairness to the regulator, once one gets into the appellate world, <laughs> Both the registrant and the regulator are very much at the mercy of court court listing, because because everything has to be done within twenty eight days of the hearing, but it, it, it regularly takes six to nine months to get a substantive appeal for the first. And what about the effect of making the order? Um, because after they'd he'd said he was going to appeal, that's just automatic, is it, or is there any discretion? I, I, as I understand it's by operation of that, that part of the schedule, that the moment you appeal the direction, so that the panel are directing the registrar to erase, the moment you do that administratively, it's all held in abeyance until your appeal has been determined. That's right. you are dealing effectively with an appeal on a section 40 appeal, mm. which is the statutory right of appeal. Yeah. From the original hearing. Yeah. What's, what's gone on to happen is that the as, as the original sanction envisaged, there has been a review here. A direction has been made to erase, mm. and therefore... Yeah, that's different. That, that, that's different. Mm. All right. Are we, uh, it, it, I think... We're, we're, we're probably done with ground three, so let's go back, back to ground one. To, uh, you, you, um, uh, I speak only for myself, but you, you will have picked up the vibes that I, at any rate, think that um, ground two is at the heart of this, but you'll obviously want to say something about ground one, but don't leave yourself no time for ground two. No, no. all right. Well, I, I'll, I can go very, very swiftly through Ground one. It's about the sufficiency of a lawful basis and the extent to which a doctor may express opinions about scientific, medical, or even say political opinions. And uh, we do uh, submit that the prescribed by law condition in Article 2 is, of course, uh, met that the um, courts 
in, in determining that needs to look not only at the uh, applicable principles, and this is at page 10 of our uh, skeleton date of the 20th of July 2023, which you will find. Just behind tab one, there's a cool bundle. Do you have that? The core cool bundle just behind tab one. So there's my bundle's got an authority's bundle certificate, and then it's got our skeleton argument, and then then there's an in the core bundle index after that. Your your skeleton argument is page 43 in my core cool bundle. Thank you very much. Hopefully it's the same skeleton. Yes, it is. Um, we do have an improved one in the sense that there's greater pagination. Reference is updated 15th September 2020. Which paragraph are we looking at? I was, going, I was looking at paragraph 23 on page 10. The, the rest is really background, sets out the charges, and I don't think I need to trouble you with any of that unless uh, I'm asked to. Yes. But we've dealt with the permission decision. And then we, this is the, that, so the, there is a qualification which includes protection of health and reputation of others. Then over the page, um, the interference has to be, this is paragraph 26, both in accordance with domestic law and to meet basic standards of accessibility and foreseeability. Now, the interesting thing is, and my learned friend, we, we've hopefully, hope we have quoted the relevant parts of the, of the judgment. And they coincide um, with the uh, highlighted uh, parts of the judgments. That's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. Um, and so what we've reproduced um, in 27, your lordships will find paragraph 49 of the judgment at page 29 of the authorities bundle. And in, it might be odd that this is slightly internally contradictory, um, but the law must be adequately accessible. Citizen may be able, must be able to have an indication. Mr. Ford, don't, don't read it out. Don't read it out. You've seen it. All right. Well, I, I didn't know if you've seen it for the first time or not, but anyway. Yeah. But you'll see the, the, the um, underlying portion, which seems to qualify the first part of that paragraph. So they need not be foreseeable absolute certainty. This is unattainable, highly desirable, may bring excessive rigidity, and the law must be able to keep pace for changing circumstances. And the law, we, we would say that misconduct simpliciter is difficult to define, which is why it's so broad and generic in the statute. The relevant parts of good medical practice uh, also define things perhaps not in the the, the, the tightest way, but unlike the, the authority that's been cited to you, this is not a, 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 pro, a statutory process. This is a, a regulator giving guidance and expecting a degree of appreciation on the part of the regulated party as to the sort of behaviour that would bring the profession into disrepute or undermine public confidence. These are intelligent uh, human beings that are being regulated here. Uh, it, it would place far too onerous a burden in our submission upon regulators to define precisely the nature of every aspect of conduct which could undermine public confidence or bring the profession into dis disrepute. The social media guidance is dated 2013. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, possibly even early 2000s, doctors and other professionals were not indulging in social media activity, and all the regulators have, had, have been on catch-up. When only friend submissions to be accepted, then the <coughs> regulator effectively has to be prescient about every possible variation of conduct and misconduct that any professional could indulge in. And that's why in cases such as Roylance, that was seen as another step change, because your lawsuits will no doubt recall the complaint there was that the government's clinical, the medical director, was acting in an administrative capacity 
not in the, the, the regular part of his duties. There have similarly been complaints about private activity, the very early cases involving allegations of uh, pornography um, viewing um, or, or novel or new offences or um, potentially um, being drunk and disorderly. It was said, well, I did that in my, in my private life on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and nothing wasn't at all wedded to the practice of my profession. But it's the, it's the disrepute aspect of it which the regulators are so, so keen on. And you'll see that from many of the Bar Council decisions. Um, it's undermining public confidence in your profession. That's one of the, the fundamental tenets that they're there to protect. So when one combines the statute with good medical practice, I know you're familiar with this document, and it's to be found from page 440 onwards. It talks in terms of guidance. So it's not statute, it's guidance. And it's a constantly evolving document because on 442 you'll see it has for this period when it was published, when it came into effect, and it talks in terms of the latest version of the guidance in the penultimate paragraph. And then it talks on page 444 of explanatory guidance at the end of the, of the booklet, which is an attempt to uh, explain certain types of conduct, which are going to be reproduced for you. Um, first section, professionalism in action. So, end of paragraph one. Uh, doctors need to act with integrity and within the law. Um, paragraph three. Good medical practice describes what is expected of all doctors registered with the General Medical Council. It is your responsibility to be familiar with good medical practice and the explanatory guidance which supports it and to follow the guidance they contain. And then paragraph four, you must use your judgment in applying the principle to the various situations you will face as a doctor, whether or not you hold a license to practice not relevant here, whatever field of medicine you work in, and whether or not you routinely see patients. You must be prepared to explain and justify your decisions and actions. So it's extremely broad brush, but with the privilege of professionalism goes the perhaps the the onerous nature of, of, of regulation in the public interest. And this has always been seen, my lords, as a protective jurisdiction. Most specifically, both the learned judge below and the um, panel dealt with acting with honesty and integrity, 65 and 68. La Lady Justice Andrews was concerned about that because there was no dishonesty charge. Uh, but it's really aimed, in, in my submission, at integrity. Um, and the co your conduct must justify that's this is 65 you must make sure your conduct justifies your patient's trust in you and the public's trust in the profession so it's not patient specific at all Dr Adil doesn't need or Mr Adil doesn't need to have met somebody he was dissuaded from having a vaccine in order <coughs> to come before his regulator and the, the, these views were widely propagated and you've seen the terms in social media, but very much in reliance upon the fact um, that the doctor was a doctor. And the panel were clearly much impressed by the fact that he was using those credentials they, they felt to give added credence to uh, his view. Then 28 we deal with uh, Chauvy, and you've had the quote from that. Um, and we have, uh, and we do maintain, that the combination of the legislation and the case law uh, means that uh, this is sufficiently closely defined. But perhaps I could just take the Lordships to paragraph 32 on page 13, internal number 13 of our uh, skeleton, which to give you the combination. page 55. So the judge in his judgment said, taking the loan provisions in the Act and reading 32, do no more than authorise the duty to set standard professional conduct. 
made clear that misconduct can be a premise for a conclusion that fixed, practitioners fixed practice impaired and provide that where fixed practice impaired arranged disciplinary sanctions arise for consideration and application. But it's our submission that the Act has to be read in the light of the overarching objective and the relevant case law. And I've already mentioned Voilent's uh, uh, remedy in the UK against the General Medical Council. Um, just because you can't find the standards of propriety ex precisely expressed in good medical practice, has never before precluded courts from nevertheless finding that a specialist tribunal were entitled to find misconduct. Because as I've, I've submitted, misconduct is, is not something that can be placed into <coughs> in every circumstance. Uh, of course we recognise it's a balance. Um, we cite in paragraph 34 in, in Ray a solicitor and we, 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 we cite this with, with, with approval. It's, it's looking at professional conduct rules for equivalent of general medical practice. But they're there to identify in particular those areas of conduct. And I stress the word areas of co conduct. So it can be misconduct, it can be health, it can be conviction. Um, nobody would suggest if it was a conviction that unless you had every single criminal offence defined in good medical practice or in the statute, that you, you couldn't find yourself before your regulator or after a conviction. The fact that such particular area of conduct is specifically dealt with does not mean that all other conduct is permissible or within the standards of the profession. I'm about six lines down, page 56, paragraph 34. It is thus ordinarily open to a professional disciplinary tribunal to apply sanctions for professional misconduct generally, regardless of whether it is conduct singled out for mention in the rules. Were it otherwise, professional people might be permitted to conduct themselves in plainly deplorable ways without any disciplinary control. So we submit that where practitioner's conduct objectively is liable to undermine public confidence and or adversely affect public health, it is foreseeable that they will face regulatory action, irrespective of whether or not their conduct can be said to breach any specific requirements of good medical practice or other guidance issued under Section 35 of the Act. You make that submission without reference to the GMP. You say that is simply inherent in the disciplinary code, which uh, gives Itself notice is... that uh, you can be disciplined for misconduct. Yes. So you, you say 30. anybody seeking advice uh, about what amounts to misconduct would be bound to be advised, do you, that A, as per Roylance, it means falling short of the standards to be expected of your profession, and B, it's generally known, is this how you put it, that, that, not, not that, that, hold on, please. Sorry. It's generally known that that includes undermining public confidence or adversely affecting public health. Because otherwise, I don't see where you get those concepts from in paragraph well, thirty-five well, of your skeleton. Well, well, we say precisely that, and of course, regulators have a dual role. They're not there to protect the, just to protect the public. They're also there to guide the, the regulated. Uh, and and so, um, well, I might cite my own anecdote. I had a difficult ethical problem on Tuesday. I rang the bar standards board. They're my regulator. I'm not. I'm, I'm not, you're not sure you're engaging with what I'm asking. Where would the advisor to whom the doctor goes turn in order to say, here is the clear law that misconduct in a regulatory context includes anything which undermines public confidence or adversely affects public health in the doctor's context? Where, well, where, where's the case law authority that he would go to to say, well, there we are, well, that's clear? Our position is that it, this is really a matter, or should be seen as a matter of common sense, rather than necessarily having a statutory provision or a specific provision in good medical practice. You're looking at case law, so you keep abreast of what's happened to others in your profession, <coughs> possibly around Article 10. You have your medical, medical defence organisation that you have to be a member to, who have lawyers and doctors, due to qualified people often, who can give you ethical advice. And they also can seek the advice of the regulator. My, my client wishes to indulge in this activity, is he, is he likely to fall foul? Right. But if, if, you, if you are not allowed to have recourse to anything that's in the GMP... Well, 65, we say, no, are, Forgive me. At the moment, we're on your respondent's notice point yes. that the Act itself is sufficient. Yes. 
and we must test that by reference to what's in the Act and not what's 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 in the the further statutory advice. If you, that's the right expression for it. Yes. Now, what is the uh, that the advisor advising on what misconduct means in the Act could turn to? For these purposes, it can't be the guidance. What could the advisor turn to to say? Well, I can advise you confidently that misconduct includes anything which is going to bring the profession into disrepute. Sorry, just give me a second. Remedy UK. Could we look at Remedy UK? Paragraph 37, page 166. Is that the supplementary authority? Yeah, the main body. Okay. So paragraph six you're relying on? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, Mr. Lordship, read the first five. I have. I don't think they make any reference, do they, to bringing the profession into disrepute? Um, sorry, it was, it was the, the, the two kinds um, in paragraph one, but yes, six is probably the most apposite to that which we're discussing at the moment. Why does this matter? I mean, the, the GMP has paragraph 65. Yes saying that um, conduct which undermines trust in the medical profession um, renders you liable to sanction. Um, it, as to whether its application to these facts is um, proportionate, that's ground two. But why does it matter for the prescribed by law whether whether you go simply to the primary statute or, or to the statute plus the guidance issued under, yeah, under well, it. That, that's the alternative submission that we've made. We've yeah. said if, if you're not happy just looking at Section 35, I said that for the regulator's perspective, and I, I'm their mouthpiece for these, <coughs> their, their primary position is that Section 35 states misconduct, and that should objectively be discernible by your averagely competent practitioner. If you're against me on that, we would say that the combination of Section 35 Good medical practice and the social media guidance and case law would be enough for an advisor to say this looks as if you might fall foul of undermining public confidence, in both in public health and in the profession as a whole. Well, I understand why you say that by, by reference to uh, confidence in the profession. I'm not sure I understand how you say that the GMP guidance brings in the alternative that you uh, rely on um, in relation to don't do anything that will adversely affect public health. I mean, I can see that you might say that you don't need it, and this is where your respondent's notice point comes in, because most people would say uh, it's the function of doctors to maintain and promote public health, and therefore anything that's going to undermine public health is self-evidently going to be um, professional misconduct, but that's the respondent's notice point, which for, for which your respondent's notice would matter. Not all, yes, but also if one looks at the content of what was said, so we have to come back to the, the facts of this case. Um, in, in my submission, if, if you are propagating theories uh, about murder, Bill Gates, 5G, the non existence of a virus, um, an overplaying of problems in China. Um, 
suggesting that the population will be controlled if there is a vaccine. And this is pre-vaccine. Um, Lord, you may be interested to know that a view has been taken because of the take-up of the vaccine that it's less profitable to be pursuing this sort of action once the vaccine was available. But this is prior to the vaccine being available. And that's why it was regarded as so egregious by the regulator, because it was putting people off before there was a solution in place. It was warning them against looking at vaccination as a way out of pandemic. And it was, in fact, denying the fact of, of a pandemic which flew in the face of government advice, flew in the face of the advice of the chief medical officer, who is himself a doctor and on the medical list. If one's talking about personalities, as some of the case law did, Mr Gates is vilified, and by implication, so is the chief medical officer. Well, we're still on prescribed by law, yes. so keep going. Yes. Um, well, I think I can, I can speed up a little. Um, if we could go to 39, yeah, which is page 57, or well, perhaps, perhaps 36, this is what we say this was the misconduct, just to finish that, we say it should have been obvious the highest of a global pandemic using his professional position to promote conspiracy theories that had no basis in fact or evidence contrary to public health messages aiming at saving lives that could lead to regulatory action being taken against him. It's not necessary to refer to the guidance and evidence was the case. Nor was the GMC required to frame the regulatory charge by reference to a specific provision of good medical practice. What tends to happen, as you'll see from the um, determinations here, is the charges aren't framed by reference to good medical practice, but, but reference to good medical practice, once the facts have been found proved, is always made at the impairment stage, but not at the factual stage, and not in opening. Then you, you have your alternative submission, starting at paragraph 37. We um, rely on the way in which the judge expressed himself uh, in his judgment, and particularly from paragraph 17 onwards, and that you'll find at page 118. Where the judge says this, the obligation within paragraph 65 of good medical practice to maintain public trust in the medical profession is framed in general terms. The social media guidance confirms the obligation applies when using social media such as YouTube and also makes clear that serious or persistent failure that presents a risk to public trust in doctors can be misconduct. That is the only sensible way to understand the statement that such action will put your registration at risk. Although the obligation is stated generally, in the context of the regulation, that is sufficient for the purposes of the prescribed by law condition. Standards such as paragraph 65 of good medical practice reflect the general body of obligations attached to the profession and are capable of being readily understood by members of that profession and certainly with the assistance of appropriate advice. And then he deals with... Um, fact that there is a specific reference to paragraph 65, but in his view, on the facts of this case, he did not think that was an error of substance, but it's right to say, by implication, he thinks it is an error not to charge in future by reference to good medical practice. My, our submission is that that would place quite a constraint if this, there were novel misconduct that wasn't covered by good medical practice. What, what then is the regulator to do? It could be quite egregious, but something that nobody has ever predicted a doctor might do. <coughs> and he get, then that analyzes further in 18 and 19, which I'm sure your lordships have read, and then 20, having dealt with um, Mr. Hall's submissions, he goes on to say this, that, that being so, these matters do not affect the outcome of the submission on the prescribed by law condition. The condition concerns position prospectively, i.e. whether it was or should have been reasonably foreseeable to Mr. Adil that his actions might conflict with professional standards set by the GMC. On the facts of this case, taking account of paragraph 65 of good medical practice and the GMC's social media guidance, the answer to this question is yes.
then 41, we deal with what we describe as a narrow textual analysis of the provisions uh, in terms of paragraph 69, uh, whether it's enough that it's, it's broad guidance, not necessarily in the doctor-patient relationship, but the patient population as a whole. Um, 42, we reiterate that 16 <coughs> says when communicating in a professional capacity with patients or colleagues, you need to make clear the limits of your knowledge and make reasonable checks to make sure that any information he gives is accurate. And this is where, in our submission, the, the doctor's changes of position become quite important because at times he gives the impression that he knew or came to know what he was saying was wrong. Uh, and my Lord and Lord Justice Popperwell made an observation right at the beginning of the hearing, uh, which was that although the concentration here has been on Article 10, it was a representation made and, 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 and found to have been dishonoured by the panel to the responsible officer. Uh, and in my submission, or in our submission, if your responsible officer says, this is causing a problem, it might be best if you remove those references, pull back those videos, and as the panel found, that isn't done, then in my submission, that, that's advice from the person on the ground who is responsible for the direct supervision of the practitioner. I'll just take you very briefly to a um, Fuller, I'm sorry to harry you, but I do the same to Mr. Hall. We, yeah. we can't sit late tonight. No, no, I'm, I'm, one, one of our number has to participate in a swearing in ceremony, yeah. and we have not yet got to um, uh, ground two. I'm aware of that, but I, I just feel I need to make sure that... Um, you have great experience, so I'll leave it in your yes. hands, but please don't run down the clock. No, I won't. Um, if, if for reference, the part of Dr. Yusuf's statement that I would ask you to remind yourselves of uh, starts at paragraph 5 of his statement, which is page 221 where he says that there was a conversation in May 2020. Several medical personnel had expressed concern about the video, the videos that were not reviewed the NHS. He apologised and stated he would remove the videos from social media, but he did express he had no control of other persons reposting information. Um, we discussed the fact that videos were a discussion and expressed an opinion. I informed him that if he had an opinion, he should make it clear he was representing himself and not the organisation. I explained to him that people who view videos are possibly easily influenced and do not always have the mentality to challenge information and believe opinions, especially when he is represented as an NHS expert. And this would have de a detrimental effect on the organisation and the public. And he says he has no issue with his competence as a surgeon. So in terms of advice, uh, in my submission, and as you're aware, videos were posted a considerable time after that, that May date. That was the position. Proportionality, if I could, if I could assist you on the first ground. Yes. It begins at our page 59, my lord. I hope. This is fairly uncontroversial in terms of the legal principles of paragraph 49. Yes. And then the principles, uh, 51. And then our submissions, uh, I hope are reasonably succinct. Um, the judge gave reasons which we adopt between Paragraphs 21 and 30, 37 and 41, and then we've got the pagination for you uh, for so stating that the sanction was not disproportionate. And he uh, indicated uh, a 
and you'll you'll see his um, judgment is page thirty seven. I don't know if you'll know page one hundred twenty four. Where um, In 38, he says this, it's clear from the determination on sanction that when deciding what sanction to apply, the tribunal had well in mind that Mr. Adil had been subject to an interim suspension order. So that matter is referred to by both counsel for the GMC and Mr. Adil himself. See the sanction determination at paragraphs 11 and 31. Then it quotes their conclusions. And the judge says this, just below paragraph 71. <coughs> this decision, page 125, rested on careful consideration of the GMC's sanctions guidance. The decision is entirely consistent with that guidance, including paragraph 22, which concerns the significance attaching to interim suspension orders. Uh, and I've read that to you already. And 40, considered in the round, the tribunal's decision on sanction is entirely consistent with the sanctions guidance, and the tribunal's reasons fully explain why a sanction of six months suspension for registered of practitioners was appropriate. Having regard in particular to paragraph 68 of the determination on sanction, in particular, the conclusion that Mr. Adil's fitness practice was currently impaired. I'm satisfied the tribunal's decision that there should be a six-month suspension was one properly available to it. The tribunal did not refer to Mr. Adil's new employment, but it did not need to do so. The key conclusion for this purpose, too, was the conclusion that fitness to practice was currently impaired. The point of mark concerning risk to patients is a false trail. It is clear from the tribunal's reason that it did not consider this to be material to it to sanction decision. The suspension was not imposed on account of any such risk, but rather as a way of addressing the need to maintain public trust in medical practitioners. And then he deals um, with the suspension, uh, the immediate suspension, mm -hmm. uh, and is, it would appear, untroubled by that. And then in our submissions, if you'd be kind enough to turn back to page 61, uh, 53 deals with the judgment I've just taken you to. You say this at 54, the tribunal were, the were in the best place to assess what was required to maintain public confidence in the judge was right to attach weight to its evaluation of the substance of the complaint so far as it affected professional standing. Uh, the tribunal's determination on impairment relied upon careful consideration of the nature of the proponent's comments and the context in which they were made, and there are five points made uh, there. the first three are the most important because there was a specific finding that identifying himself as a doctor was, was a way of promoting his, his opinions and then if you go over the page um, having found all three limbs the overarching objective and accordingly, the conduct fell seriously short of conduct expected of the doctor and amounted to misconduct. Uh, we submit that's fully justified. Um, we, it, often, uh, we sort of um, slip back into uh, discussion of whether the sanction was proportionate, whereas the burden of Mr. Hawes' ground too is that the restriction on freedom of expression in, yeah. inherent in in, uh, in this charge is is a disproportionate restriction on freedom of expression. And, and we say quite quite clearly not. <laughs> no, you say quite clearly not, but but um, it would be more helpful if you explain what why not. So 57, page 20, internal, and then in terms of your pagination, it is sorry, 62, I'll go
So the absence of more specific guidance or authorities directly on point is irrelevant to the issue of proportionality. All of these cases are fact uh, specific. Uh, and certainly it's very much a decision on these facts against this, this background. We, we, we say in terms, if ground one isn't made out, then ground two can't be on the basis of foreseeability of regulatory action. Um, we don't really understand the assertion about um, the lack of an attempt to determine whether any of the appellant's factual assertions were correct or to formulate a test as to what was legitimate in the, in the light of the admissions made by the appellant that his statements were not correct at stages uh, and, and the judge described them as obviously baseless and outlandish. And we would respectfully adopt both those adjectives. And misbehaving is authority for the proposition that the, the works you get to freedom of speech will necessarily be affected by what you're saying. If you're saying, well, there's this legitimate argument about whether vaccines work or not, it's different from, from just asserting something for which there's no evidence. Um, well, that, that's why, for instance, the comments, I'm not suggesting you should read all the transcripts, but there are other comments about things like face masks and social distancing, which were deliberately avoided because they remain contentious to this to this day. But to deny the existence of the bias um, was, in my submissions, the judge said, baseless and outlandish. And so there has to be a balance between the interference and the content of what's said. No friends seem to be suggesting that the only cases where there was a valid restriction of freedom of speech were cases of obvious and blatant discrimination. But my lord, that's why it's so important to contextualize. This is a health regulator dealing with a health professional talking about health matters. And you say that the statement that the virus is a hoax and doesn't exist, it tends to be injurious to public health because those who view the video think, well, it doesn't matter what I do then. I don't have to follow the guidance. I don't have to follow the medical, in effect, it remains to be seen what uh, Lady Hallett makes of mm. government's actions, but we were told continuously that the, the government were following the science. <laughs> 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 well, that, may, that may be rather controversial, but anyway. Oh, it certainly the, is, but um, um, as I said, the chief medical officer himself, a registrant, was advising us. No doubt he thought to the best of his ability yeah. almost daily. And his channels of communication with those that were engaged in research in, into vaccines and efficacy are uh, almost certainly going to be far wider than anything. Mr. Adil, with respect, would have access to. And in my submission, that therefore is seriously undermining of public health messages. Can I ask you one question, really, sure. about freedom of expression and registrants? Yeah. Because, uh, and you've got obviously immense experience in this field, but experience does show that sometimes registrants who get um, take a view which is extreme, not necessarily supported then end up with their regulatory body, then end up never agreeing with their regulatory body, then end up getting struck off when it all could have been sorted out so much easier, more easily. And doesn't that, that sometimes the, the, the whole... The process. Um, yeah, add to aggravate the whole process and, and fail to respect freedom of expression. I mean, fine, it might not have been very valuable expression, given that he himself has admitted that it was wrong now. But, but the, the, that you end up in a situation that is disproportionate at the end. Well, that, that's why careful consideration is, is um, <coughs> taken of which cases, and even within a case, which aspects of opinion could be legitimately challenged. So, so as I've indicated, my Lord, if you look at the transcripts, you'll see there are quite a few other uh, interesting, I think it's probably the most neutral way, putting it, views expressed by Mr. Adam where the regulator took the view that it really wasn't uh, worth having a debate. And, and regulators are also very aware of giving people with such views a platform. 
um, because if, 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 if it's going to be difficult for you to establish uh, what it is that you say uh, allows you to interfere with Article 10 rights, um, then most sensible regulators will, will walk away. And, and if your lordship looks at the factual determination, you'll see Mr Kitchen was at pains to talk <coughs> about Article 10 to, to the, uh, as the presenter and to tell them, uh, if my recollection serves me correctly, I think he, he cautioned them against looking at matters outside of um, the charges. Bear with me for a moment. So right at the beginning, I think when they're looking at their, the tribunal's approach, um, it's page 139 of the rule. Standard proof 15, legally qualified chair, in mind of the tribunal, Mr. Kitchen had drawn its attention in his opening submission to the important issue of freedom of expression and particularly the provisions of the European Convention of Human, on Human Rights, Article 10. It was important in the context of this case. Mr. Kitchen referred the tribunal to the case of White v. GMC, which concerned restrictions imposed upon the use of social media by interim orders tribunal. However, as part of the judgment, Mr. Justice Dubb provided a useful review of the issue of freedom of expression. He made it clear that although Article 10 provides a broad right to freedom of expression, it is not an absolute right that is qualified. One of the qualifications specifically identified within Article 10 is the legitimate aim of pursuing public safety and the protection of health. The only friend talks about reputational damage, but it's in there. It's in, you know, it, it's very much highlighted. And then um, you've got uh, some uh, other advice which are, is, is uh, Irrelevant. And I believe that that was reiterated at the impairment stage. So, um, if your lordship goes to page 155. Nine, relevant parallels to good medical practice, social media guidance, statutory overarching objective and sanctions guidance, proportionality, that's in relation to uh, clinical matter, then in relation to um, Article 10, again, he reminded them in paragraph 22 of page 156, And ask for those submissions, previous submissions, to be uh, adopted. The GMC acknowledged that many of the views expressed by Mr. Adil in the video, videos fell within legitimate free speech, even if they were controversial. So that distinction is being made by the presenter. However, the views in paragraph two, and that's if the charges went well beyond this and amounted to misconduct. Context of the pandemic in paragraph 23. Then, when they give their reasons at page 164, they in paragraph 69 specifically acknowledge provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 10. Mindful that everyone, including doctors, have freedom of expression. However, although Article 10 provides a broad right to freedom of expression, it's not an absolute right that is qualified. One of the qualifications specifically identified within Article 10 to is the legitimate aim of pursuing public safety and the protection of health. The tribunal bore in mind that the numerous potentially controversial comments have been made by Mr. Adult in the video that have not been brought by the GMC to be a part of any allegation. They included, for example, opinions on mask wearing and the discharge of elderly pa patients from hospitals. While potentially controversial, the tribunal agreed with the GMC's position that these remained in the domain of freedom of expression as well as the wider public. Perhaps to give an example that I spotted going through, one of the laudable um, concerns that Dr. Mr. Adil had was his colorectal cancer patients, whom he felt were not uh, being operated upon timiously. 
because of things such as lockdown and matter of that sort. And, and the backlog that he was predicting in the early part of 2020 has now materialised. No, nobody challenged that in these proceedings. And then they go on to say, however, the statements made by Mr. Adol, I'm at 71, on the basis of paragraph two, life as a host did not exist, promoting and perpetuating various conspiracy theories, suggested that vaccines were in development for the deliberate harm or manipulation of the public. The tribunal had already found these were contrary to widely accepted medical opinion and undermined public health by the conduct of the medical profession. It was gravely concerned that these were made by Mr. Adol using his credentials as a doctor in the UK to promote his opinions and to engender trust in him on the part of those listening. In the tribunal's <coughs> view, these could not fall within the domain of legitimate freedom of expression for doctor in the context of the pandemic at the time. Such statements breached the trust the public had a right to expect of him as a doctor in the UK. Despite his protestations that he was trying to help in a period of widespread confusion, his comments went far beyond helpful legitimate comment into the realms of scaremongering conspiracy theories which added to public confusion. The effect of these statements could have been that, for leaving Mr. Adil, members of the public failed to adhere to the required restrictions or failed to get vaccinated when vaccines became available. The tribunal had explained the context of the pandemic in its earlier determination. I'm mindful of the time. Um, I think I've dealt with sanction at the beginning because we start yes. round three. So, my Lord, yes. I can assist you or, or, or your chips or any other, I can sort of ask behind me if there's anything I've omitted to say. Yes, of course. Sorry, I'm very grateful to those behind me. Um, there's a concern that the impression may have been given that when the six month, I'm sorry, we're back to this, <laughs> suspension was imposed under Section 35, because it's a direction to the registrar, that the Section 38 immediate suspension, which runs during the currency of the appeal, 28 day appeal period, but then continues if you do appeal until the appeal is resolved is an automatic order. It, it is not. It's a separate, I see Lord Justice Popperwell shaking his head. It is, it is a separate and distinct order. I, I, I thought the court had understood that, but those behind me weren't, weren't sure. And so they're, they're saying, therefore, if you're looking at the proportionality of the Section 35D sanction, the six months, that the, the Section 38 isn't relevant the instructions from behind me to the Section 35D decision. Now, I'm aware that your Lordships have expressed concern about totality, if you want to use a criminal expression. Um, so where was the order imposing that separate order? At the very end of the... Um, <coughs> so, so you should have full determination. Uh, yeah. Is that page 182, my Lord? It's a very short determination. But it's certainly not in every case that an immediate order is imposed. So it looks as paragraph three as if it was necessary to uphold public confidence in the medical profession. And a submission made that there's a risk of repetition. Then you've got Mr. Adil's submissions. And then nine, it says the tribunal has exercised its own judgment, taking account of principle of proportionality. The tribunal has borne in mind it may impose a legal order where it's satisfied it's necessary for protection of members of the public or otherwise the public interest or in the best interest of the practitioner. I mean, clearly, the third one doesn't apply. It's also considered an immediate order may be particularly appropriate where there was a risk to patient safety or need to protect public confidence in the profession. So they say there's no risk to patient safety, but the tribunal made serious findings of misconduct, significant concerns about the impact of the conduct on public health and public confidence in the profession. 
balance the public interest of Mr Adams' own personal interest and consider whether it's appropriate to return an otherwise competent search to practice pending a substantive determination taking effect. On balance, the tribunal considered the maintenance, promotion of public confidence in the profession could not be assured by Mr Adam being permitted to return to unrestricted practice pending the conclusion of any appeal he may choose to lodge. The tribunal therefore determined the immediate suspension necessary in order to protect public confidence in the medical profession. So then he's suspended under section 38. And, and was there any appeal against this immediate order? No. As I said, can you appeal? Yes, against? you can. Um, and I think you can ask for expedition as well. But uh, again, I don't want to be unfair to my friend. The impression I got at the first instance hearing was it wasn't appreciated that the suspension wasn't being served alongside the immediate order, whereas they're, they're, they're consecutive to use the criminal and um, if, uh, I understand why you might say you need an immediate order because the insight hasn't been put right, etc. And they've given him certain things to do in the intervening period as well. Right. Um, why would that period not itself count towards a penalty if at the end of that period he, he came to you and said, yeah, in the period of time that I mistakenly thought counted, I've done X, Y, and Z. And doesn't that make it disproportionate? If he went and was able to show the three bullet points, the reflection, etc., yeah. he's entitled to ask for an early review. So there are situations where your practitioner is assiduous, says, well, look, I'm not working. I'm going to do all the online testing. I've set up various ethics courses, whatever else it might be. I might come back within six or eight weeks to their MDO and say, I think I've ticked every box. In those circumstances, you can apply before the six months has elapsed for an early review. And if you, and if you impress the... Um, and what provision is that? In the, you'll give that as... I think... Let, let me have a think. Of it. it might be under... 35, is it? 35, 35, 4B, I'm helpfully told. Thank you. And while I'm just asking, can I just ask you to look at page 125 of the court bundle, which is where the interim search is guiding that is very helpfully set out. And I just go back to ask you these questions about it. It's paragraphs, um, it's just about paragraph 40, it's set out. Yeah. And this is the GMC's current interim sanctions guidance. Uh, and it says the tribunal should not give undue weight um, to whether the doctors had an interim order. And it says, first of all, because it makes no findings of fact. Um, that doesn't in itself engage with whether or not there has, in fact, been a, a deterrent sentence overall surge. Um, Similarly, it then says, and its test for considering whether to pose an interim order is entirely different. Of course, but that, again, is neither here nor there to the fact that if you're looking to preserve the reputation of the um, profession and to punish someone so that everyone knows not to do it, um, the punishment might be served by the interim order. So is this reliable interim, in, interim guidance? Well, I think the difficulty is not all, but at the time the interim order was made, there is no decision on the facts. So, so theoretically, the practitioner could turn up to an FTP hearing and be acquitted on everything or get out at half time. Mm. If, however, there are findings of fact adverse to the practitioner, that's when the fact-finding tribunal in possession of all of the facts and all of the aggravating factors and all of the mitigating factors can then decide on appropriate sanction. I accept it's not clear on the face of the determination they took it into account only to reject it, for instance. But, but my lord, I, I would respectfully suggest that the, um, that section is accurate in the sense that certainly those who do, do, do the work are aware and we're very astute to what an interim orders tribunal can do as against an FTP. And in fact, quite often, the FTP, in fact, I think almost always, do not have the interim orders tribunal transcripts. Sometimes the allegations have changed. Sometimes charges are modified as a result of evidence. Witnesses don't come up to proof. Uh, so you might have a witness statement um, from uh, a complainant 
about an allegation of sexual impropriety given to the GMC. A year later, you get the police statement. They're entirely inconsistent. You cross-examine on that basis. The panel, even on advanced probabilities, very, very rare, this, um, find the complainant not necessarily convincing. And, and, and the doctor hears no more of it. So it's a very different exercise. But if you get an allegation of, let's say, three allegations of sexual impropriety, the risk assessment that's made is, I can't tell whether these patients are telling the truth or not. But I can't risk this doctor having access to patients uh, until. Well, I think I think I think we're going back to the argument uh, uh, with which you began. I think we've got that. Um, uh, uh, we would be grateful if um, uh, Mr. Mant and then Miss Laurent would agree a list of the orders that were made in this case, not whether they were a good idea, bad idea, nothing like that. Um, date, order made, page reference in the bundle, statutory section under which the order was made. And I include orders of suspension, uh, orders imposing conditions, and um, uh, including anything that takes effect by operation of law. Um, we've referred to a lot of these, but it would be helpful a single document if we can impose on Mr. Mant to do a draft and Miss Laurent hopefully to agree. Yeah, I think those that sit behind me can certainly get the dates of every interim order. The suspensions are straightforward. But yes. you, you want to know about the conditions, and I suspect the conditions um, refer to a matter which is understandably kept confidential. Um, well, it, all right. I mean, if there's some difficulty about setting out the detail of the conditions, it will be enough to say um, uh, such and such a date, um, uh, 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 conditions imposed on practice. Um, uh, for health grounds yes. or whatever. Um, uh, don't put anything which uh, uh, it's inappropriate to mention. But but this business of six months suspensions and then uh, something happens automatically and something doesn't and so on, it would be very good to have it all on one yes. sheet of paper. I'm sure we can do that, thank you, Great. Right, have we covered the grounds? I have Right, we're very grateful to you. Thank you. <coughs> Some points in reply, if I may. Yes. Um, in, in respect of ground one, my Lord, Lord Justice Popper will ask um, about reputation. There is, um, as I was unsurprised to find, guidance in the social media guidance about respect for colleagues that addresses reputation. It's, it's, you may not need, just given the time, if I can just give you the reference, it's 482 in the um, appeal bundle, um, and it says, you'll find it when you go to it, but you're, you're, you must not bully, harass, make gratuitous, unsubstantiated, or unsustainable comments about individuals online, when inter 16, when interacting with or commenting about individuals or organizations online. Uh, you should be aware that postings online are subject to the same rules of copyright and defamation as written or verbal communications. Now, that easily provides a sufficient legal and foreseeable basis um, for it to be clear, as it was to Mr. Khan, the barrister, that those were permit not permitted by the guidance. And, and I, would, would, would posts that the barrister didn't exist the professional reputation of those who were publicly saying that it did and this was my action had to be taken well i i submit that that is a, a considerable stretch if i may um and if i may go back to the case of morris in france which i'm very grateful to know from at least most of my find it is and it is helpful um it's not right to say, as I hope your lordships remember, that I said it would be acceptable for a lawyer to deduce um, a personally a judge. I didn't say that. In fact, I expressly said that that probably goes well beyond what it would be appropriate to do. But in fact, this case, in the, this Strasbourg case, and your lordships will have an opportunity to read it in the court, makes very clear that there are limits for lawyers 
in respect of the commentary that is appropriate on cases and on judges trying those cases. And it will probably not come as a great surprise to see the way in which the Strasbourg Court put it in 2016 in relation to France, uh, because essentially they um, <coughs> reiterate, they, they, they make the observation that uh, finding at paragraph 134 that lawyers are entitled to comment in particular on the administration of justice, provided their criticism does not overstep certain bounds. The bounds lie in the usual restrictions of conduct of the members of the bar, dignity, honour and integrity and respect for the fair administration of justice, turning the page on that authority. Um, a, a distinction, paragraph 136, a distinction should, however, be drawn depending on whether the lawyer expresses himself in the courtroom or elsewhere. Of course, very strict professional conduct obligations that, that we have at the bar um, that when addressing you here, fairly foreseeable. Um, the next um, paragraph, lawyers have a duty to defend their client's interests zealously um, and uh, talks about duties in, in um, and then it turns to remarks made outside the courtroom and there really we do have quite a direct analogy with the comment about denying the virus and whether or not that went to the reputation of those who say there was a virus. Now inevitably if one is commenting on a matter of public affairs and one says, um, in fact, it is very common, including for professionals, to talk in terms and say accuse political leaders of lying or misrepresenting the truth. That is common political parlance. Uh, and so in my submission, it's rather different to saying Chris Whitty um, is a liar because he said X about so-and-so and that's not true and that's a defamatory comment, um, in which case uh, there would be answers in defamation, and that might be a professional conduct matter, given the reputational requirements. Um, but in respect of public comments, what is mentioned in the um, case of, uh, um, in the, the Morris and France case, is um, that lawyers, however, paragraph 139, make remarks that are so serious that they overset the permissible expression of comments without a sound factual basis. And a footnote there, is to the case of Carpetas. Um, Malona Jr. very kindly found me a very short, just in the time available, I'm sure we can get the, 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 the um, report, but just to say the context of that, Mr. Carpetas had insinuated that the prosecutor and judge had taken bribes from his assailant <laughs> on account of the remarks he made about them. Um, the Office for the Investigating Judge and subsequently in the context of proceedings find them. That is a world away from saying a matter of public, as a matter of public record, whether or not the virus exists. A statement of that nature made in a public uh, broadcast. It is a very different situation. There's obviously a duty when um, lawyers are concerned and they're criticising within the appropriate bounds a, ju a, 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 a judgment. Sometimes it happens to be judges. Um, or the administration of justice, and they make up a false allegation about an individual. That's just not what this is. And, and, and again, Professor Whitty came up. Again, Professor Whitty wasn't mentioned. Now, obviously, there are all sorts of people in the government um, who are making decisions <coughs> that were heavily criticised, impliedly or expressly, by Mr Adil, and indeed by many, many others, professionals and others. Um, the simple fact that one of the people in front of the television cameras informing government policy, and I emphasise the fact it was government policy, not simply medical advice, was a doctor, means that somehow that is, how is that, in, in my submission, that is very far away from being a foreseeable basis on which a restriction could and should be imposed. Again, if Professor Whitty had been mentioned by name and a false allegation had been made about his conduct or something of that nature, then clearly that would be potentially at least a foreseeable, there would be a foreseeable basis for a restriction for sanctions to be imposed. So my submission, that point, not one that should fall. Um, my learned friend at one point said co common sense was sufficient. Well, common law is sufficient. Um, Chalvi and France and Sunday Times uh, in the United Kingdom make that very clear, but common sense is, frankly, in these circumstances, a nebulous concept that has no place 
um, and is certainly in, in, in um, legal tests and is certainly not a basis for saying something is foreseeable. Now, I appreciate that as lawyers, we're familiar with the, the man on the Clapham omnibus, what the reasonable man might think. Um, in terms of, or, or do in terms of negligence and other tests, uh, but that's rather far away from what is foreseeable as a restriction on the freedom of expression, bearing in mind not only um, the, the required by law, the prescribed by law condition, but also remember section 12 of the Human Rights Act, which elevates within the human rights that are um, incorporated into English and Welsh, well, British law, I suppose, all, all jurisdictions, um, it, it gives that an elevated status. Going back to this question of legitimate, um, it, the, the, the decision that this was not legitimate was made by the tribunal, and um, the reference for that is paragraph 72 of the determination of, in, on impairment at page 165. My submission... Uh, which I think I made, is that this is in fact a backwards formulation. It isn't for the tribunal or for the, any court reviewing the tribunal's decision to decide what opinions are legitimate. What it is for the tribunal to decide initially was whether it is legitimate, that is to say in accordance with law and necessary in a democratic society, to restrict the freedom of expression of an individual for the purposes of, in this case, public health, and in other cases you've seen the authorities, your Lordships have seen the authorities on the other cases. Uh, and, and that is not the way in which this was formulated. Um, and again and again, it's very apparent that however much it might be said that there is a particular difficulty with, say, denying the existence of the virus, the same point is reached as to why it is legitimate and why it is necessary um, there is a it is necessary in a democratic society to restrict freedom of expression. The same point comes back to it will encourage people not to follow government advice. It will encourage them not to take a medical treatment. Doctors have always disputed about the efficacy and the appropriateness of medical treatment. So have other individuals. And to restrict the ability of a doctor to advocate for or against a medical treatment is a significant point. Now, I appreciate the point that's made about the denial of the virus, which is it's said that that is made with no factual foundation. Now, uh, whether or not that is a finding that it is capable of making, particularly in the knowledge that there was in, in early to mid-2020, is, 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 a, is a perhaps a live and open question. But again, we need to turn back to the necessity test, and it's necessary to have this restriction in a democratic society is the test. Um, and in my for submission, the protection of protect for the protection of health, in, and, and that question, um, inevitably, if, if the outcome is, the desired outcome is that the government's public health, because this is very clear the basis on which the tribunal made the decision, and made the decision of the, about the need for this restriction. If the quest, if if it is to be suggested that it is necessary because the, the government's advice might not be questioned, that could potentially put all sorts of comments in the public domain beyond the pale, and it directly engages the duty of this court and the tribunal and the GMC to be neutral about ma matters of political dispute because all of these decisions and these, this guidance, whether it was based on health or not, was a matter of public policy. And that's important to bear in mind, um, particularly uh, in the context of ground two in my submission. Um, yeah, so I think I've dealt with, I think those are all the, the, the points on which I'd like to address your lordships on written reply. What, what we can do is we can find the best um, uh, report of the Carpetus case, um, which sets out that point about the falsehood said by the lawyer um, about, um, I think it was the prosecutor and the judge in that case, which is the site of the footnote. And that's the only, um, that's perhaps the most relevant 
point because it's lawyers cannot make remarks that are so serious they overstep the reasonable expression of, or comments without a sound factual basis. And, and without more, that might appear to be said in all cases, including talking about political, medical, general matters relating to the administration of justice, for example. But in fact, it's a very specific example um, and, and very foreseeable that, that that would engage a restriction on the freedom of expression of the individual, in my submission. Um, In respect of ground three, I would simply ask your lordships to, as, as my learned friend very fairly did put it, that the um, date on which, or at the date on which the suspension was imposed, it was found that there was no risk to public safety and that Mr. Adam was an otherwise competent surgeon. And so to the extent the penalty was necessary for a, for a reason other than a punitive reason, um, it, it was about the reputation of the profession, and I, if I may, endorse entirely Lord Justice Dingman's question about that, as I know it's a <coughs> provisional question, I'm not suggesting it's more than that, um, which, which is that it would be sufficient for a panel, ultimately, whether the tribunal or, 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 or Mr Justice Swift or your Lordships to say that in other circumstances, six months, if that's what your Lordships consider, might have been appropriate. But now that that has served, it's not necessary to require a further service. Um, the exercise that our learned juniors are doing, my Lords, um, I, I think it's right to say that, in fact, um, from the date of the appeal against Mr Justice Swift, um, at a certain point, that suspension did start to run. So it is perhaps less of a pressing issue for your lordships, and there are other issues which, which your lordships are aware of, perhaps a less, less of a pressing issue for your lordships, but it's sim still an important point of principle that is before your lordships, and it did affect directly the decision of Mr Justice Swift, because Mr Justice Swift could have, and in my submission should have, um, found that if six months were sufficient, but given the extensive period, I may just clarify, I've got not Matt Lord there, but um, a matter of well over two years by, by the time it got to Mr Justice Swift of, of, of suspension directly attributable to this action, that, that 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 would be sufficient and simply declare that because of that, it is going to revoke the um, suspension only because of that, and that would be a sufficient basis to show that if it was necessary, um, the um, deterrent effect. But I would also um, question how appropriate it is to um, have a deterrent element to this sentence, um, because I appreciate that that is, can be an appropriate basis for a sentence, um, but the only basis for a deterrent sentence in this, or deterrent sanction in this case, could be to dissuade doctors or others from talking about matters in the public interest, and that is yet a further um, interference, um, at least, with the freedom of expression of all doctors, actually, uh, because the chilling effect is, that it's, uh, uh, it's a phrase, it's a trite phrase, but it's not an unrealistic phrase, and it's one endorsed by many judges and many um, uh, uh, courts in this jurisdiction and elsewhere, that it is, will inevitably, though, matters like that will have a chilling effect on the freedom of uh, expression of individuals and are to be um, discouraged in my submission. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Mann, Ms. Laurent, uh, will you be able to give us this document by Monday morning? Yes, by the way. Yes, thank you very much. We're very grateful to both teams for their oral and written submissions. We will, of course, reserve judgment and we'll let you have that judgment as soon as reasonably practical. Thank you very much. Same. Yeah. Same. Same.